lot of good building stones around here. It's been a couple years, yeah. Round trip to I'm Salt excited. Lake City. Salt Lake City. The base of the prowl. Something blue way over there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a person or a rope. I found a book in the college library at Western Carolina. And I don't know what I was looking for at the time, but it certainly wasn't a book about climbing. And I just picked this book up. It turned out to be a book called Modern Mountaineering. And it was by George, George Allen Smith, I think was the person who wrote it. And it was largely um, sort of a beginning text for people going to the Alps, I think. It was very slanted toward Alpine kind of climbing. And... Uh, I thought, man, you know, this looks this looks like fun. <laughs> and uh, the best I could judge from the pictures, they used a rope for something, and these little nails that they drive into the wall. You know, how they get those to go into the rock like that? That's a puzzlement. So, uh, based on the uh, invitation that that book extended, I thought. Okay, I finally got the idea that you do it usually with, with another person and that the rope is basically there to catch you if you fall off the, the rock. And having no idea that you could buy this kind of equipment, I, I made some pitons out of, they're probably out of sheet metal. <laughs> you know, just something just absolutely weak. Uh -huh. But it, it looked right. It looked like the same thing that George Allen Smith was using. And he had an ice axe, and although there weren't any big ice fields in North Carolina, I'm thinking, well, you know, you need an ice axe anyhow, because sometimes the brush scrambling gets real steep, and you never know when you might need to chop into a roto root and pull yourself up. So I found a little uh, a World War II Army surplus pick that was small enough that you could put it in a rucksack to dig a foxhole with or something. And I cut it down a little bit in size so that it looked more like what George Allen Smith had <laughs> and um, found a, a rope, probably in my dad's basement, probably pro polypropylene. I don't, that was it. That was, a, and, a, and a ball peen hammer. Wow. And that was, that was it. And what so the only that? thing. How old were you? Uh, I was. I had just uh, transferred uh, over to Western Carolina. That was in 1962. So the only other thing I could see that was lacking uh, for me to become a real climber was to find some other person to who also wanted to do this. The side over where Wiseman's View is, uh, and we looked across at Table Rock, and. It was a while before we ever went over there. I met Bob Mitchell at Camp Sequoia. He had been hired as a, a, a counselor and to, a, to be the assistant to the person in the rock climbing program, the mountaineering program, they called it. So when I got to Camp Sequoia, you know, Steve Longnecker said, hi, this is Bob Mitchell. He's going to be working with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, Bob Mitchell, mm -hmm. glad to meet you. Mm -hmm. Call me Mitch. <laughs> I never had any other impression of Mitch in the years that we climbed together except that that he is almost in a different league than I am <laughs> wow and we did a lot of we did a lot of climbing we climbed a lot of things and uh, had some good first descents and and there were even times when maybe on Bumblebee Buttress and I think I may have already told you this but I'll say it again it was his turn to lead a pitch and he he said, Robert John, he said, Bob, I'm not up to this. Would you mind leading it? And I thought, good gracious, you know, this is like Jesus asking if I'll walk on the water for him. <laughs> and he told me that, Bob, you've got to come and look at this. I, f I found this place. And 
he took me down to the and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm remembering my ge geography right here or not, but we went down to some place where we could look look down and out to the right, and down there was this wall. And he said, look at that line right there. Doesn't that just call to, for us to go down there and climb it? And um, we bushwhacked our way down into that, to the foot of that cliff, and... Um, Bumblebee would have been the first thing that we did there. Yep. Keith was one of the partners in that school. And he took me and Roy Davis and maybe Steve Longnecker. I, I don't know who was all, who all was there. But he took us down to the amphitheater. And at that time, there was no trail there. It was just... My, my, my recollection of it was that it was like kind of walking into a, a paradise of some sort. There was a, a cliff with moss and a waterfall coming down off of it. And at the bottom, it was flat and grassy. And uh, you, you could have built a house there, and it would have been a wonderful place to have a house uh, in the amphitheater. But um, we went there and marveled at what a beautiful place it was. And then uh, I guess we kept on going on around to, to other climbs, uh, mm. to the prow maybe. I, Mm -hmm. Again, I, yeah. Um, and uh, so maybe the first climb you did down there was the mummy. I think it was the mummy. Yeah. And, who and was when it? Mitch and I went down to do that, it was like, oh yeah, there's this beautiful amphitheater kind of a place. We I don't know if we gave it that name or not. We may have mm -hmm. uh, because of its, you know, obvious amphitheaterish yeah. shape. Uh, but Mitch and I and maybe Steve went on down to do the mummy later. Tell us about the, uh, was it the second ascent? Somebody did it nude? Uh, <laughs> uh, Roy Davis and Brad Shaver and I may have been the three of us. There could have been a fourth member. Let's show that picture of Brad. Is it Andy? Yeah, it's, uh, it's right here. Okay. That was in 1976. That okay. Was and uh, all right, we'll talk about Brad in a second. <laughs> you and Roy Davis and and Brad, and um, on the final pitch of the the mummy, Roy had gone. He had led and had a belay ledge up top, and he wondered why Brad and I weren't, why one of us wasn't coming on up, and what we had done was take off of our clothes. Brad and I took off all of our clothes except our boots and put our climbing ropes back onto us. And we both hooked in at the same point, like, you know, just three or four feet apart. We were both hooked into the rope there. And and one of us did the talking. Like, I would say, Roy, okay, up rope, we're, we're coming up, climbing. And, and it took us a little, we went a little slower because there were two of us banging into each other as we yeah. came up the rock. And we thought that this would be just so funny and that Roy would just find it hilarious, you know, and you guys are such cut-ups. And we got up to within sight of Roy, and he just got so pissed off. He said, you know, the two of you climbing together like that, if you had fallen, I couldn't have caught you. Uh, that was stupid. You know, and he stayed mad about it for, for a while. Wow. Brad started coming to our house in Asheville about uh, early early 1970s. He was just out of school. Uh, it, or maybe he wasn't even out of school. Uh, he, as I remember, Brad was, uh, I, I, I think maybe a little bit naive and, and certainly just, he, he hadn't, he hadn't, made a lot of worldly experience yet. But he wanted to climb, and he had a, a natural ability as a climber. He was very good um, with his balance and his moves and his fluidity. And he started more or less hanging around with Roy Davis and Bob Thompson, who was also climbing with us then, and I. 
maybe with Steve Longnecker a little bit, and, and eventually Brad uh, figured out what was going on, and he started making climbs of his own. Um, I think he he did some hard climbs. I can't tell you what his record was. I don't know which climbs he did, but he was pretty good. Uh, he eventually went with a friend to the Himalaya uh, to climb um, a peak whose name I cannot tell you in northern India. Dhanagiri. Dhanagiri, that's it. And uh, he did not come back. Mm -hmm. He was lost. He and his partner were lost. And no one knows for sure just what happened to him. Mm -hmm. When did you start um, easing out of the climbing scene? 1981. My friends and I went to the Grand Tetons and did the Cathedral Traverse, Traverse together. Which consists of? Uh, Tiwanot, Mount Owen, and the North Ridge of the Grand. And it was so satisfying to us and to me that uh, I think it kind of uh, sated me. It was pretty much um, a good culmination for what I thought was a pretty long climbing career. and. Uh, I did not burn to climb after that. I sh shifted my interest to, to other things. My beloved ice axe that Barry Corbett sold me in 1964. It's a, it's a wooden shaft. I don't know what kind of wood. It's a big, big heavy clunker thing that's long enough that you can use it as a, a cane if you want to just have a walking stick. Um, it's especially good on real steep snow fields. If you take a fall, you can just kind of, you know, stick this thing under your armpit and just bear down on it like this into the hard packed snow and you'll stop real quick. Um, for belaying, you can pound it down into the snow until just the head sticks out and wrap a, a little piece of webbing around the top so that it won't slide down the shaft. And you can use that to belay if you don't put too much sudden load on it, but a real sudden load on it will break the shaft off and, and there goes your climbing partner. It's got a little reinforcer that comes down front and back, so that gives the head a little bit of extra strength, but it will break off right there. <laughs> I've seen some broken ones. This is my only real collector's item, is my climbing paraphernalia. This is a piece of spring steel that came off of a, the springs of an automobile, probably a T-model or something like that. And it's cut off the end of the sheaf, the, the shackle of spring, the, the leaf of spring, tapers from about an eighth of an inch down to nothing out here at this end. And it's got a hole drilled in it. <laughs> and this uh, I found on the north face of the Grand Teton, uh, early 1970s. And I showed it to someone at the climbing, uh, the climbing uh, ranger station, and they said, "Oh, that's one of Paul Pedzalt's original leaf spring pitons." And the best they could date it was about 1935, or maybe even a little earlier. And uh, I, I've, I think I'm going to see if anybody out there in a museum might like to have it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't climb with it anymore. <laughs> These, are, these have been written about in uh, the, the Teton guidebook, like Paul Pedzalt was, he made his own pitons out wow. of leaf spring steel. Wow. This is one of them. Uh, my pitons were not so elegant. This, this is going back now to that 1964 guidebook that I read about George Allen Smith. Uh, not a guidebook, but instructional book. And he had some pitons, so I figured if he can make them, I can too. His had little teeth on them, so I figure I better put teeth on mine. This may be part of a piece of aluminum pie plate or something. I don't know, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's, it's pretty flimsy. Uh, but during those, those early days of going up to Cashers from Western Carolina, this is what we used. We had a, you know, a half dozen of these things, and uh, we never took a big fall on them, as you can imagine. But they worked okay for, for what we asked them to do. And uh, our carabiners consisted of nice steel pieces like this that are, you know, what, 15 pounds each or so. 
And in pieces like this, this is this was the first carabiner I ever used, and it's a hell. I can't even get it open now. Well, just take my word for it that it opens up. <laughs> it's it's made to link two logging chains together, and if you open it up and and put a rope in it and then close, snap it all back shut, you've got a, a real live carabiner. It's kind of heavy. You could pull a bulldozer out of the mud with this <laughs> this thing. But, uh, you know, at the time we used, we had to improvise. We didn't know there was a climbing shop anywhere, so mm -hmm. we made our own stuff. And this clothesline, you know, it'll hold a heavy load of wash when you hang it out, so it ought to hold us too. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe this stuff. They're going to say, that guy's lying. I went to uh, University of New Hampshire. I transferred there in 1958. And uh, I arrive on campus uh, and uh, go through the orientation for transfer students. And I come to this booth uh, that says New Hampshire Outing Club. Uh, sign up for a weekend of climbing next weekend. And I said, yeah, well, that sounds good. See, I grew up on a 60-acre farm, so I spent a lot of time outdoors. I did a lot of camping and so forth, but, but I'd never really done any, any climbing um, per se. So I took advantage of this uh, sign-up with the New Hampshire Outing Club. And uh, my first climbing was in uh, Agunquit Beach, uh, right north of uh, Portsmouth was a cliff that went into the sea and uh, you, you wanted to be there when it was low tide um, so uh, but it was great and you know the first thing that happened to me was uh, on my first top rope pitch there and we didn't have slingshot belays in those days there was a young woman I was quite interested in and she was belaying me and I said Geez, I got to do this right. <laughs> it was probably the first time in my life that I couldn't fake it. Uh, remember Willie Unsold's famous statement? I think he got it from me. I said, geez, I can't fake this because I'll be discovered. <laughs> so um, so it, re it was really good for me because I needed that kind of uh, discipline. And so um, I, I got to say that... Uh, I put, uh, I, I wasn't eligible for sports that year because I was a transfer student. I was looking forward to being on the ski team, but I spent just about every weekend climbing uh, in the fall of 1958. So, um, Whitehorse Cathedral, Stonehouse Pond, places like that. Um, and uh, it was just great. I loved it. And, and such good people. And one of my mentors was a guy named Carl Love, Smokey, we called him. Uh, he was a graduate student, um, and uh, he made me down climb everything. Uh, and uh, I couldn't figure out why we were going to do that, but I am forever grateful for that. About eight years ago, I got to ask Alex Honnold that question. I was able to interview him at the Harvard Travelers Club, and I said, Alex, can you down climb everything you up climb? And he said, I wouldn't up climb if I didn't think I could down climb. That's what's keeping me from doing El Cap. There are three sections on El Cap that I don't think I can down climb, so I got to have them wired. So, I mean, that just that spoke to my heart yeah. right there. You know? yeah, right. Um, so, anyway. Um, Graduated college um, and uh, taught high school for a couple of years. Continued to climb. I was 20 miles from the Gunks where I was teaching high school. And then um, I decided that uh, I didn't want to nail myself down in this uh, private school teaching gig. So I packed up my Volkswagen bus and went to Alaska. And I uh, went to graduate school in Fairbanks and uh, lived with some wonderful people there, including Keith and Anor Jones. Anor, um, actually Bucknell at the time, nobody will be able to tell me who was the second woman who climbed Denali. Anor Bucknell. 
And so uh, uh, what happened that uh, fall, 62, is uh, a bunch of my buddies from the Tetons and, and I and another fellow connected. And we said, let's do Denali in the spring. Let's try a new route. That's what we did. But that wasn't my first expedition. My first expedition was actually in 1960 um, in uh, the Selkirks of British Columbia. The leader of that was a guy named Bill Putnam, who was pretty well known back here in the east from uh, Appalachian Mountain Club and, and his bluster and so forth. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, met him at Pinkham Notch, uh, the winter of uh, 59, after I'd just come down from being in Tuckerman Ravine, which was closed. <laughs> and uh, um, we were sitting around the, the uh, dinner table there at Pinkham Notch, and Bill was carrying on about the Selkirks. And I said, I'd, after dinner, I said, I'd like to go on that trip. Um, he said, all right, well, you look like you might be okay for that. <laughs> he was he was a great mentor. And so um, he sent me the list and one thing and another um, for what we needed to bring. And we're going to meet in Golden, Colorado, or uh, Golden, British Columbia, uh, in July of uh, 1960 to go for a six-week trip into the northern Selkirks. Brilliant. Wow. Absolutely brilliant. All right, back to Alaska. So we did go on Denali in the spring of 63. Um, and that was a 48-day um, trip. Uh, we did a first ascent of the East Buttress. Uh, and in that particular year, there were probably 15 people total on the mountain. But it was also the same year that the Wickersham Wall got done by John Graham and some other people. It was, I mean, that that's a spectacular climb. But East Buttress was, was a good effort, too. Uh, those of us on the expedition, there were six of us, and uh, everybody said, why didn't you go to Everest? We said, well, we were considered to be too young. Huh. We, were, we were, I was 23 at the time, and oldest guy was... Um, Rod Newcomb, he was 26, um, but uh, we couldn't help but tell our friends who went to Everest, actually, we climbed more vertical feet than you did. <laughs> we start, you know, we started down the Ruth Glacier at 4,000 feet, and, and Denali's 20,320, so anyway, that was one of the best expeditions of my life, but uh, we did some, did some lovely climbing. And, and Perry climbed the uh, table rock with me. She was still climbing then. And, and somehow or the other, she got pregnant. And her climbing days dwindled. But my climbing days didn't. We were up on Linville Gorge on looking down the, uh, the gorge and looking at the cliffs in the distance, saying, geez, it'd be great to climb one of those things, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, but how the hell are we going to get there? Because uh, it was flat out bushwhacking. Mm. I don't, Mike, I don't know what it's like right now up there. If you can actually walk to the base of places like Short Off and, yeah. and the Mummy. Yeah. You sure as hell couldn't then. All right. Yeah. So um, um, that's we went down and, and said, let's figure out a way to get there and see if we can struggle up one of these things. Uh, and that's what we did. Um, I think it was the fall of 69 that... Uh, we bushwhacked to the base of um, uh, the climb, and we were both wearing Peter Limmer boots at that point, state-of-the-art boots. Uh, and uh, we did that climb. And we didn't write up a whole lot about it, but we um, we did it, and it was fun. The prow did? Really? you talking about the prow? The prow, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. And, and Shortoff was involved also, but that I can't remember uh when we did that but uh the prow is we did the first set of the prow yeah and uh how many years did you serve as the editor of north american accidents oh yeah um in um i became a member of the american alpine club because of my friend bill putnam after the uh, selkirk expedition and i went on another one in 1962 um and in 63, I became a member of American Alpine Club, thanks to him and Ben Ferris, 
who started accidents in North American mountaineering in 1949. Um, uh, it was then called Safety in the Mountains or something like that. 1974, uh, Ben had been at it for 25 years, and he said, well, Jed, uh, it's your turn. You're going to take over the editorship of Accidents in North American Mountaineering. And I said, yes, sir. Uh, at that point, I was teaching at University of New Hampshire, so I had some support systems going and a lot of contacts in the parks because I'd also at that point been doing quite a bit of guiding for Exum Mountain Guides. So I took that on, and thank God I had a wonderful, uh, what we then called secretaries. We don't call them secretaries anymore. But a woman in the ed department at UNH who did all the keystroking. So in in 74, I became editor. And I think the first uh, journal I did was probably like 36 pages or something and got up to a 140 or 150 pages. Um, and I did it for 40 years. And it was very, a very informative work. And it was a way to do community service um, and have a wife and two kids and a job. Advice for future climbers? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, well, remember that the two leading causes of accidents in everything is trying to stick to a schedule and trying to please other people. Um, so uh, always pay attention to what you're doing, uh, who you're climbing with, and have clear communication with them and, uh, and agree upon such things as turnaround times. Uh, agree upon when you've reached a point where it's really not a good idea uh, to keep trying this route unless you have different training, different equipment. Uh, and develop a relationship with your climbing partner. One classic story is about a young man who signs up online to climb with a guy who's in his 50s. He's a trad climber and young man is a sport climber. So they're at the base of a climb in Utah and young fellow says to trad climber, would you lead? And he does. And he gets up uh, and he's about uh, 20 feet beyond his protection. Uh, and to put in another piece, he, he calls for slack. And his sport climbing new young friend thinks he said take. Slack, take. See, the signals have changed over the years. So we've got to learn that stuff. So Buddy takes and pulls him off the cliff. Oh he didn't die, but uh, he lands right near uh, the, his belayer and, and sees his belayer is belaying okay, but he also has his cell phone out because he was on his cell phone while he was belaying. We can't do that, Mike. Yeah. Originally, I was born in Manchester and uh, used to go walk in, in the Pennines, which is a gritstone climbing area. <clears throat> and uh, when I was about 14, I saw some climbers and thought, oh, that'd be cool to try it, you know. So I, uh, I started going out to the uh, local crags, which are the gritstone rock, and uh, gradually worked up. In those days, we kind of worked through the grades. You start very easy grades uh, up to what then was VS, very severe and then hard severe, and um, excuse me, extremely hard. And uh, the, 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 they were the open-ended grades at the time. So it, it was later that. Um, they adopted a, a, an E system, but that, that was 40, 50 years later, it seems like, anyway. But um, after that, I used to go pretty much every weekend. Um, we'd camp out at a local crag, uh, Stanage would be in one, one of the crags, and we'd get there by train and, uh, and or by bus, whichever was convenient. And, uh, We'd stay the weekend and learned how to rough it and uh, learned how to live on negligible food. And uh, Did you teach yourself or did you have a mentor? No, basically taught myself. Uh, 
and then some people took me to North Wales and uh, they weren't as good at climbers but they were more experienced and they said well you're, you're doing all the leading that's the only reason why we invited you <laughs> so it was 15 year old dragging around some 30 year old uh, <laughs> folks you know but we, we had a great time and uh, from there um, as, as I rose up through the ranks as it were I joined um, a rock climbing club called the Alpha and Alpha uh, had some great climbers in it uh, to name some was uh, Pete Crew, uh, Barry Engel and uh, Martin Boyson and, and Richard McCarty which all of them late, later on uh, did expeditions all over the world so um, I had uh, a lot of seasons in the Alps and uh, spent eight weeks one time my employer gave me the time off so I couldn't cause any trouble at the plant so uh, he, he gave me a full eight weeks off so I was able to climb in the Dolomites and the Bregalia Alps and Chamonix wow. so I had a great time doing that when did you meet Anne? <clears throat> it was uh, really just before we came to America and what what happened there was um, I, I knew a sister's husband I used to climb with him so he got me a blind date with uh, with Anne and I didn't know it was a date that included me <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't either <laughs> and, and, and could, could finish the tale of well, well, actually, me, me I, not paying <laughs> I actually met him when I was 13 when my sister got married but I was, this is where yeah and this is a sister that lives here in town she lives in Pumpkin Town okay. South Carolina and so then later on when I was 18 I guess they decided to get us together so um, but she forgot to tell us that him so, and I didn't have any money we went to a Chinese restaurant and, and it was like well there's my money <laughs> oh my god <laughs> so, really yeah I never dated him after that so I actually went to a big climbing um, weekend with a bunch of climbers and um, Art was there and there was lots of, it was mostly males back then yeah and when I got there with two or three of my girlfriends all the um, all the guys had been several days uh, talking about climbing and such like, and beer everywhere and such like. And um, so anyway, Art protected me that weekend. He became my men, my savior oh, that yeah. weekend. So from then on, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. What year was that? That's about sixty four, four or five. Yeah. Somehow. Okay. We used to go up to. Um, to North Carolina crags uh, like Moore's Wall and um, Hanging Rock and uh, Pilot weekend. Mountain. Really? Yeah. Every from here or weekend. Sanford? No, no from Sanford. Sanford. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we, we read about a guy called Guy Jacobson that used to uh, actually live in Chapel Hill. Yeah. So I climbed w with him and uh, we did several new things on Moore's Wall before we. Uh, it, it became really um, famous, as it were, yeah. or popular. Some of the guys that, that were met over here, uh, they were in D.C. And they were the first ones that I knew about that came to look at white sides. But they actually didn't climb on white side. They climbed on a black crag to the left of it and lower down in the valley. Yeah. And didn't realize till they drove around the corner on the way home, the white side was oh. there. So they they actually did a like a a five pitch route and um, didn't realize they they weren't actually on white sides. And they ended up going to Yosemite and climbing with um, Tom Evans. So we we did some great routes there. The the local Sierra Club. Uh, a guy called Ted Snyder, who later became president of the Sierra Club, said, well, why don't you form a climbing group? So we formed a group called the Spiders. And I got the name from the Italian guides who were the climbers of Cortina. 
Anyway, so uh, I climbed out of Greenville for um, about 10, 12 years and uh, introduced some of the local famous guys like Doc Baines and uh, Buddy Price to, to climbing. Through the Spiders Club? Yeah, through the, through the Spiders. And tell me about Linville Gorge, your explorations up that way. We, we started going to Linville and um, the majority of the climbing was in the little crags at the top and then uh, on Table Rock, North Carolina. And I was a little bit disgusted and I vented my anger a little bit. There were so many bolts stuck in the, the rock on, uh, on the um, climbs that the Outward Bound used to do. And I thought, that is not the way to teach people to climb. Just, just wrong, you know. And uh, so we we climbed a f few of the classics there, and then uh, went down into the gorge and did second or third ascent of uh, Bumblebee Buttress. There was a real classic, mm. but in those days there was no trails, so you kind of had to bushwhack through the laurels and. Uh, mm. and any of the other undergrowth mm. and we climbed uh, a climb called Rinky Dink that, that was down there and uh, the Zaga, the Corner and one called the Limey. Uh, they were going to call it the Lime Drop because I, I fell off on one of the moves. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know if anybody does those climbs anymore. Uh, and we, we, we uh, Mike Holloway and I did uh, the daddy. And we, we knew that the mummy had been climbed, so mm. the obvious thing was to call it the daddy, mm. which is the front of the buttress. And we got to the bottom of it, on the very first pitch, about five foot up, there was a damn bolt. To this day, we don't know who put the damn thing there. Wow. I suspect that the Guys from Outward Bound were trying to instruct some of their guys <laughs> to put bolts in, you know. And uh, it, it was like, like an engineering company, you know, <laughs> showing them how to put bolts in, uh, in rock. So we did that climb, it's a real classic, um, not very hard. And uh, then we, we come down the gully in, in the backside of, of the, the mummy Buttress, and then go across and solo out the prow. Really? So, so it made a really nice long day. Wow! No ropes? No, no, no ropes on the prow. No, yeah. we just just wow. scrambled up. We kept the ropes for the children because we were hiking. We always camped in that area oh, with yeah. the babies and stuff, and we always had ropes left. <laughs> no, no, we had. We, we we climbed with ropes on on the daddy. Yeah, yeah. But as far as getting out from there, because uh, that that was a really rough hike going from uh, the the bottom there around to Bumblebee Buttress, you you had to basically crawl most of the way. Yeah. And there's another really nice climb down there called Tarantula. It was a really good climb. Mm. Did you and Bob Mitchell put that one up? But to, to the truth is, Bob, I was there, and Bob Mitchell. Um, I think it was um, Ron Cousins. Mm. He did the first ascent, and they were running out of daylight, so they kind of said, "Well, find your own way back. We'll see you at the top." So I ended up missing out on that, but I did the second ascent of it, uh -huh. and. Uh, it's a really good climb, wow. yeah. And Bumblebee Buttress, really good climb. And who did you put up the limey with? Was that Mike? Uh, Mike, Holloway? Mike Holloway and uh, Bob Mitchell. Okay. And mm. what, who did the slimy? You remember a uh, called yeah, the Yeah, a guy called Gil Harder. Mm -hmm. He was a, a bomber pilot, I believe, out of Fort Bragg. And uh, he, he used to stay at the house and I'd tell him, where the climbs were and all of that. Eventually he went to the Himalayas and lost his life there, so, mm -hmm. 
he, uh, he, he, he never panned out, you know. Did you ever climb with Brad Shaver? No, no, I knew Brad, but ne never actually climbed with him. He had a pair of, uh, first pair of really smooth shoes called Green Gollies. And he got them from my hometown of Manchester. Hmm. There's a, uh, a company called Ellis Brigham's. Oh, yeah. He used hmm. to have them made locally. And maybe it was Reebok that made them, but there were several cobblers that would make shoes, yeah. custom shoes. Hmm. And uh, they, those, those came out of that technology. Now, uh, you had to have well, PBs back then, was the real Yeah, best well, yeah, I remember Roger Stevens had a pair of gollies. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you remember Roger? Yeah. He passed away a couple years ago, a uh, construction accident. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. How about John Lawrence? Did you ever come across him? No, knew, knew of him, but uh -huh. ne never he you know, on with him. Mike Fishesha asked um, all of us that had anything to do with climbing all those years back, actually in the late 60s in North Carolina, if we would like to contribute to a sort of, um, I suppose, a historical uh, record of the best we could remember. Well, I'm, uh, this is many, many years back. Um, I'm in Connecticut now and uh, I'm not sure that my memory uh, will record any of it well. So I'm going to try and stumble through this for Mike. I started climbing actually with um, the sun of a very well-known, one of the first British Everest climbers, Jack Longland, his son John was at school with me. And we used to escape, um, bicycle off to a quarry where he introduced me to cigarette smoking uh, and um, climbing. And uh, I've, I must say that I, I was uh, very attracted to both. And um, I went on an outward bound course when I was about 16 years old in Oswater in England and was able to realize that I was fairly um, agile and able to climb fairly well at, at that very early age. I'd climbed trees a lot. Uh, and uh, so when it came time for me to go into national service, I became a, um, a Royal Marine and I wanted to become, a, a, in effect, a, a commando climber, um, which was somebody who would go in and uh, be part of the teams that would climb cliffs, um, sea cliffs, after coming off a submarine or off a, a uh, mother ship offshore, um, either coming in by kayaking or by uh, LCPL's uh, landing craft uh, at night, typically, and then climbing up a cliff, doing some bad stuff, and then coming back and going back to the mother ship again. And that was my specialty. Um, I became trained in that up to quite a high level. Um, and then um, spent the rest of my time training others to do this. So the climbing that I was required to do was very precise in tricuni nails. Um, and one of the uh, exercises that we were required to do, the instructor would turn his back and we were required to climb about a 15 foot pitch on a boulder, which was very difficult. Um, and we were to do it without any sound. He would tell us that if we made any sound at all, either breathing or with our feet, with those nails on the rock, that we'd fail. We'd had, we had three chances to get up the rock, and um, I made it, uh, but it taught me the precision in foot use, uh, control of your, uh, not only your, your movements, but also your breathing and the sounds that you make as you climb which not, a, not all of us pay much attention to. Um, and I found the technical aspects of this kind of climbing very helpful uh, when I eventually came um, to Outward Bound as an instructor, first in England and then um, in Australia and then in New Zealand and then finally helping build the school in North Carolina. I became, uh, I really fell in love with the North Carolina mountains. Uh, we were in the Linville Gorge um, which, you know, um, is not well known outside that area. Very few people realize that the highest mountains on the East Coast uh, in the United States are actually in North Carolina. And uh, the Limbo Gorge was, was a staggering place to find myself in. 
And of course there were all sorts of unclimbed rocks everywhere. Um, and one of the uh, increasingly attractive parts as I, as I sort of explored around in those days was to find pitons, because that's what we were using of course in those days for, for safety, um, already in some of the rock because the U.S. Marines were climbing there. The Green Berets were, I think, climbing in that area. And uh, we found ourselves um, sometimes um, uh, on, a, on a spot which had clearly been done before, but we um, pioneered, I'm sure, many, many climbs down there which are not in the books. Um, Outward Bound instructors were constantly looking for new and interesting climbs to take their students up of moderate difficulty, typically. We didn't or we didn't uh, seek out the most difficult places, but we'd, we'd like long, uh, open routes uh, with some exposure, which uh, Table Rock was full of. And then, to our amazement, um, when we went down into the gorge uh, by the chimneys, we found uh, Dave Mashburn and I went down one day and uh, wandered along underneath the amphitheater, down through the chimneys and along that, uh, which is now a, a trail, I think, well, well marked, and we got to um, what sometimes is called the prow and uh, what we call Mashburn's Pinnacle at that time. And there uh, I seem to remember meeting Bob Underwood um, actually on the pinnacle. And uh, it may not have been that particular occasion, but I, I went down there quite a few times. Um, and he was showing me the other side of the gorge where um, he was interested in building... Um, he said, I remember, um, some people write poems, some people write symphonies, um, other people build buildings. He said, I want to build a trail that nobody will ever forget. And he did. And most of those who are familiar with those times will remember the Gold Coast Trail that uh, <laughs> was an amazing piece of um, vision in those days. I actually helped cut some of that uh, in those days. And... Uh, always was very respectful of the, um, the combination of awe and uh, respect for the, for, the, um, for the land that that trail was so careful in preserving. It was a brilliant piece of work. It really was a symphony. Uh, well done, Bob. Uh, one of the things about the amphitheatre climbing area was it didn't attract me because primarily I was looking at that time for climbs for, uh, that we could you know, do with the students, with the, with the uh, Outward Bound participants. And I was immediately struck by the length and the exposure and the, the uh, uh, se severity of the wall itself and the difficulty of actually getting to the place. Um, the nice thing about Table Rock from the Outward Bound perspective was that you could get you know, a, a jeep up, a transportation up, fairly close. So if anything went wrong, um, you had that kind of immediate close backup, which was so important in those days for safety. So I didn't actually um, do much climbing on the amphitheater. I reserved my climbing to Table Rock and um, did several routes in those days, some of which are in the books and some of, many of which are not. One of the better known ones um, is, I think, Second Stanza, which I did with Chuck Sproul, um, which was a beautiful climb. I'd looked at it several times and thought about it. And um, uh, the, we did the top. We aid, we uh, artificial the top overhang. Um, and since it was done, I know, uh, by much better climbers than me, with, uh, without any artificial aid. There were other climbs in the, the chimneys uh, and in the, um, the De Devil's Cellar round behind Table Rock that... Uh, uh, we, we remembered going on with um, uh, Kitty Calhoun, for example, was an instructor there for a while. And I remember she's now, of course, uh, made her name in the large mountains. We made a lot of business, I think, out of um, showing that climbing could be done carefully and uh, uh, responsibly. Part of uh, the work that we did was to get state the state of North Carolina to appreciate that climbing could be done just like that. Um, but I must say I broke the rules sometimes. On the work on the Whitesides climb, we, uh, we used to park, that was private land I think, 
but we it was supposedly then known as the highest face unclimbed um, on the east the whole of the, in the whole of eastern United States. So when I was on uh, in Alaska, um, the the lads up there, Tom Frost particularly. Um, warned me that they were having a look at white sides because uh, it was unclimbed and that if we didn't get it done quick they'd be out and, and take it from us. So John Wisnant and I um, began to look at that face and we spent a lot of time um, trying to find a way up from the, the ledge in the middle of the original route and uh, we got up to the ledge several times, in fact spent I think a couple of nights or at least one night in a terrible storm on that ledge um, uh, and managed to get off it uh, only with quite some difficulty cleaning the ice off the ropes I remember as we tried to uh, go back down and um, <laughs> we heard voices when we got down to the camp uh, and we thought it was you know friends coming up but we uh, found to our horror that this was a rescue team that had come up um, seeing our lights on the ledge and assuming that we were signaling for help uh, which of course we weren't at all we were perfectly self-sufficient we were quite comfortable on the ledge we were able to you know light up our little stoves and cook and everything and we were well tied in and we were at no no point in any danger but we we couldn't really convince the rescue team we first of all couldn't convince them that it was us that had been up there until we took them up to the fixed ropes that we'd left and showed them how we went up the fixed ropes and, and, uh, and, and, and really told them exactly what we'd done. And uh, it was a shame because I know these are volunteers and they were probably coming from work and uh, I felt rather, rather guilty about it all, I must say. Very grateful to them for the service that they provided. Climbing to me was always a, uh, a sport and increasingly as I became professional at it through a number of expeditions to uh, Alaska for example government government paid we were paid to go and, and explore these places and do various kinds of research Antarctica and then um, other Everest Foundation funded uh, research for example in Peru in the Andes and uh, I found that it became um, almost uh, an addiction for me I spent <clears throat> not only all my working days but also all my vacation times um, either on the rock or on the ice when I got to New Zealand. Well, it just so happened a friend of mine had gotten into backpacking and I think he got a hold of an REI catalog and we saw pictures of people climbing in it so that kind of you know, enthused us like we may like to try that. Well, we were actually camping on Crowder's Mountain. We had backpacked over, you know, not a very long walk, obviously. And camped on top and woke up the next morning to hear some, hear, what I now know is gear rattling. <laughs> and lo and behold, some people showed up to do some top roping. And they were connected with uh, the Sierra Club, which was getting started in North and South Carolina. I think they called it the Joseph Lacan chapter. I don't know how, how it's set up now, but, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I think they did know art. But basically they top rope with some gold mine and stuff and said, hey, you want to try this? We said, sure. Hmm. You know, that looks like fun and that was it. What, what, year, <laughs> was, what year was that? That would have been 1971. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And so then yeah, it was like, well, we got to get us a rope. And, you know, we, I ended up getting combat boots and uh, putting vib getting Vibram soles put on at the local right? shoe, shoe oh, shop. Man. Uh, bought, uh, ended up buying Bell Top Tex helmets at REI and they do double shipped them for some reason. Hmm. So me and my friend uh, Tim Leonard both had some. Yeah. <laughs> so we were, wow. we were ready to go, bought some slings, bought some beaners. I can remember putting some hex nuts on slings. Wow, that's great. <laughs> you know, so we're, you know, we were in that, that early dangerous stage. Yeah. But then found out by getting involved with what's happened with the Sierra Club, uh, this happens a group that came, there were a couple of reporters who worked uh, in Charlotte at the Observer and they knew about the Sierra Club. They were you know, basically early environmentalists. And so I, I went down to some of their meetings, but found out there was a, they had a climbing section called the Spiders. So uh, you know, I immediately you know, made sure my address was gotten to someone so I could hear about that or, or get their newsletter. And out of that, ended up uh, hooking up with you know our 
Williams uh, and the group that he started with Mike Holloway. Hmm. And then even early on, uh, that's how I met Ralph Fickle and Buddy Price because we went up uh, to one of the gatherings and they took us to the amphitheater and took us down and sent a whole bunch of people up the prowl. Hmm. And I think maybe they had another rope on something else or a team on something else. Mm -hmm. But so it was just kind of an interesting thing to meet Ralph that early. Tim and I started going up to Table Rock regularly and we found out there's bolted Ralph's there. So that, that's where we kind of again you know, cut our teeth. But we, I don't know how many, it was a super, super wet spring. And I mean, we probably went up five weekends in a row to get rain down. Oh, wow. <laughs> we were determined, of course, but uh, yeah. and eventually we were able to get up and start doing some of the bolt routes. And, yeah. uh, then met Ro uh, Roger Stevens somewhere along there, and, and his tutelage was very important because he was very, very safety conscious, you know, very friendly, mm -hmm. nice guy. So start climbing with him around Table Rock. Hmm. And then ended up meeting, um, well, of course, I I'm not sure at the time that it happened, but I ended up meeting Mickey Gregg and uh, Alex Holden, uh, Charlie Page. Uh, some other people, but it's also at the same time I ended up meeting uh, McMillan and Rotert, mm. and so we started hooking up together too. So uh, actually, I was kind of there. The reason they could go to uh, up to Table Rock and go climbing was because I was I was the adult in the group. You know, they oh, were really? four or five years younger than me. Oh yeah. So their parents would let me uh, let them go with me. Huh. So, but uh, so I, I remember climbing an amphitheater with them. Uh, I mean, you know, I've got you know, really fond memories of the amphitheater because it's just such a gorgeous place in the gorge and there's not any other place quite like that in the gorge. Yeah. It has all of its own unique characteristics. <clears throat> Tell me about you and Roger putting up Heck Fire. I'm not sure how we ended up. We were, of course, there were some other people around. There were at least a couple of parties climbing. There were at least four or six of us. And, uh, but um, I'd always kind of had the desire to try to do something. You know, I like to explore and that's why I like bushwhacking so much. Really, one of my... You know, uh, you know, my current buddies, uh, my band of brothers, kid me about being drive rather than bushwhacking than climbing, <laughs> and, it's, and it's not untrue. So, uh, but uh, you know, I was looking at the route and, and talked to Rod. Let's, let's, let's see if we can get up that way. And so he was game. So we did. Wow. And, and haven't been back to it since. I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't repeat a lot of the routes that I do. Yeah. And typically got in that group with time that I didn't didn't do established routes as much. I was always looking for something new. I really like the exploring part of it more than anything. I just like going somewhere that's you know, unknown and yeah. possibly no one's been before. Well, you know, the, the mummy, the daddy, uh, uh, Bruce Finnegan, I did Rattlesnake Crack. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, the prowl. What's next to the prowl? There's a the short cake and short, G G the short labyrinth. Cake and G -G. Yeah, labyrinth. Did all those. Okay. Did all those. Uh, later did the uh, what's it? The corner. I'm sorry. You, uh, open, open book. book. Open book. Okay. Uh, I I actually climbed that twice. Did it with the uh, rotor and with uh, Doug Reed. Did y'all do the first ascent? The first free ascent? No. Of the no. open book? No. Someone had done it fairly soon. Uh, I mean, it wasn't too long after that, that Bobby and I did it. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Thomas Kelly, and I was climbing in the amphitheater. We did some new routes there in the mid 80s and up through the early 90s. I was climbing with Mark Stroud, Ralph Fickle, Chris Klein. Some other friends, Gary Mims, was down there on a route called Ground Zero. Uh, Mark and Ralph and I did Land of Little People, I would guess in 1986. And then because of that exploration on that side of the mummy buttress, uh, we ended up later doing a couple of routes Chris Klein and I did thing called King Pump and Rock Like an Egyptian. Those were basically his leads. And then uh, Ralph, I think, had been in there on a previous occasion and tried to do something. And we ended up finishing this thing he was calling Trinidad. It's also on that side of the mummy buttress. And I remember when Chris Klein and I were doing Rock Like an Egyptian. He had gone up about 15 or 20 feet and had some small brass nuts. And, and I was just sitting in the gully, kind of on that steep slope. 
and he took a fall and we both ended up swinging out uh, onto that one RP or small brass nut. As far as ground zero, I had seen that line and was thinking about going up there. It's, you do the crux of the open book and then you immediately traverse out left on a horizontal and go around to the left of the Aret and then there's a crack out there. I had heard Doug Reed had gone in there after we had looked at the possibility and rappelled down and scrubbed some lichen off. So then before he was able to go back, we went back in there and uh, Gary Mims and I did that line. And then it was sometime after that, Chris Klein and I went in there. He led and really got the first free ascent. Here's the story on the rim trail around the eastern side of the amphitheater. It was the summer of 73 and a climber had fallen on the top pitch of the daddy and it involved a huge rescue from Outward Bound and the rescue squad and the Forest Service and he dislocated his shoulder to get him out. We whacked and flagged this rim trail going around this side of the amphitheater just to carry him out that night. He had a dislocated shoulder that got relocated, but this trail had a lot of use over the years. And uh, after that rescue that night, it has become an approach trail to the mummy and daddy and some of those routes on that side. So did y'all rappel in or did you uh um... well, we rappel a portion of the way. Really? Avoided that first section of the that trail. Yeah. How many pitches was it? This is well, this is the fourth pitch. The tailor's right behind us. <laughs> he soloed it. He did? Yeah. Off the way, Jim! After their first summer here, they hired me to um, mule train of five or six people up the, up the prow. Really? The Winston-Salem Mountain Club. <laughs> oh my gosh. And we got up, it, it was dark. It was dark 30. <laughs> what time did you start? Huh? What time did you start? Well, it didn't matter what time we started. It had too many people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when did you start climbing, Aaron? Oh my gosh, 1974. Where? Pennsylvania. Yeah. My, home, my hometown had a state park. Rust over. When did you first come down to the amphitheater, you think? Oh, it was probably the fall of 1978. Remember what you did? Um, the mummy. Maybe the daddy. Maybe the prow. Maybe all three. <laughs> I don't remember. It was one of those three. What, Jim, when did you start climbing? Uh, 70, I think. Up in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I'm not... Oh, I had a friend that went to uh, Our Bound in Maine and was into climbing so I begged him to go he was like three years older and then um, actually took a lesson somebody in the area was given lessons yeah and from the school I got permission to go do this lesson and then I started climbing up there in the same place Dover and Philadelphia and uh, the gunks do you remember when you first came to the amphitheater I think it would have been in 75 uh -huh. when I started here do you remember the route or anything? Uh, <laughs> it, it probably was the prow. Yeah. Cool. I got like busy and all the above. So. <laughs> yeah. At the crux. Yeah. No, no, it was way past the crux. Oh. Um, but I, I was cleaning it up after um, Carter's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, after Bradley's awesome lead. So he he let up no problem. Wow. But the crux was neat. It was like a. <laughs> Um, two hands way up and lock it off and throw a heel way up and then um, and then somehow work some foot magic underneath you and then throw uh -huh. for a jug. Wow. And it worked. Cool. <laughs> What's the rest of it like? Yeah. The rest of the corner. Classic system. corner. Classic. Classic corner. Classic corner with um, jams, chimneying, and um, it almost had a whole bunch of my puke. <laughs> a whole bunch of your puke? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I don't know. It's up. I got dizzy and almost threw up. The way it goes. Yeah. But um. Were you drinking last night? No. No. <laughs> What'd y'all climb today, Brad? We climbed the open book. How was it? So good. Had you done it before? Once before, probably like 15 years ago. So it was an Alzheimer's on site. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> cool. Managed to pull it out of the bag. So that hardware is kind of ancient. Where's the hardware? <laughs> There's like a couple fixed pins and a ancient quarter inch bolt. I like pulled on it as hard as I could, but it stayed in there. At the crux? At the crux. Wow. But there is alternate gear. Yeah. You don't have to have that gear. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. How's the rest of the route? It's one of the best pitches in the state, I would is say. Is that right? I mean, the position, the corner itself, um, just perfect, perfect stimming. You got some nice, and jams and uh, there's some face holds here and there it's an amazing lead cool. and if you're like a 5 10 leader and you're just like breaking into 511 I'd say it's a good one because then you could just like aid up past the crux if you're not comfortable and then the rest is like 10 B or something oh yeah wow turkey beards next yeah <laughs> <laughs> in April 2001 the task kids from Morganton humped three 600 foot ropes down to the amphitheater to do what we call a Kootenay High Line. Not to be confused with the modern day High Liners that are walking the webbing. This was a modern day version of the Tyrolean Traverse, which became unsafe because of too much tension in the ropes. And Arner Larson from British Columbia developed the Kootenay High Line. So we had a 500 foot crossing across the amphitheater and sent the task kids over. Over the years in Linville Gorge, there have been numerous fires in various locations up and down the gorge. In the fall of 2013, a spectacular fire it erupted around Table Rock and all the way down the Linville River and down around the amphitheater. And today, even today, the effects of that fire are still seen in the woods. On Saturday, October 27th, we had to rescue in the amphitheater on the daddy climb. Um, we had three gentlemen that had gone in early that morning. Um, they had trained for three weeks prior to coming to the Limbo Gorge. Um, they had made it to the bottom of the climb. One of the party had experience in outdoor rock climbing. The rest of the party had never had experience in outdoor climbing. The guidebook indicated that the climb is 5557, five, depending on whether you're reading a book or mountain project. So they felt comfortable based on their indoor experience that they could do the mummy, the daddy, and the prowl all in one day. So they started their day on the daddy. 
Um, so they got to the daddy climb, the base of the daddy, after rock hopping down through the amphitheater, which is extremely thick now, post-fire. And after getting down there, they looked at it, and um, the patient, um, who ended up being the patient, said, I'd like to go first. He had never climbed with a backpack on. While it was a small day pack and all I had was a change of jacket um, and bottled water in there, that was it. It was still something that he had never climbed with. Um, and he admitted that that change of dynamic um, definitely affected a lot of his ability to move. So he had made it up the climb about 15, 10 to 15 feet. Um, he says 15, his friends say 10. Was placing his first piece of pro in a rock um, before the piece was in the rock, his left foot came off and he began to fall. Um, in his statement, he felt like he was falling forever. He didn't think he was ever going to stop falling. Um, when he did land, his right leg caught the corner of a rock and it turned his foot to the outside, um, which case causing a compound fracture to his right lower leg. So upon my arrival about an hour later um, with the patient, um, I found a male patient with, a, with lower leg extremity. Um, he had obvious fractures. The, the bones, it was a compound fracture, so the bones were exposed through the skin at that point. Yeah, otherwise, he was in good condition, some bumps and bruises. Um, he was exposed to the cold um, from lying on the ground. His friends had covered him with their jackets and with his jackets to try to protect him. Um, he had lost a fair amount of blood from the exposure. Um, they had minimal wound dressings on there. So uh, I immediately initiated care. So uh, one of the, the humbling features about the Linville Gorge is anybody who's ever been in there knows it will let you know what your weaknesses are. The partner that I was sent in with, actually his back began having back spasms and he wasn't able to go any further than the chimneys. So I actually made patient contact solo um, and did all patient care for an hour prior to the secondary responders that were coming in to bring me additional equipment. Overall, it was six hours with the patient, um, taking care of him, administering medications, splinting his legs, protecting him from cold exposure, um, applying a couple tarps to try to prevent further exposure to him before the Black Hawk helicopter came in. The Black Hawk came in, it dropped off two Helitex. Uh, the techs came down, they looked at the situation because they were not able to drop close to us. And we had to actually um, place the patient in a sked, secure him using his harness and additional ropes. Um, and we actually lowered him an additional 250 feet from the base of the daddy down into the Linville Gorge so that the helicopter could actually make access. That night the wind was ripping through the gorge at about 40 miles per hour. Um, so the pilot, I spoke to him the next day and he said it was the tightest, most technical rescue he had performed in 35 years. So he, uh, they refused to pick anybody other than the patient. They picked the patient and they took him to Morganton Lenoir Airport where he was transferred to EMS and then taken to the hospital for further surgery. He's now at home. Um, I've spoken with him several times since. Um, he does say that he wants to get back out and climb, hmm. but he wants to do it with a much more experienced guiding crew um, and probably not on something quite as technical for a first go around. So um, it was a learning experience for him. And in speaking to him, he, he says now, you know, he, was, he wasn't prepared to be in that situation. Um, and we know from the rescue world and, and our exposure from the, the number of rescues that I've done in the Limbo Gorge that probably 85% of them is preparation. Um, a lack of preparation either to the location they're going in or the equipment that they bring with them. Um, and in this case, it just happened to be preparation for where they were going. When I was building the ropes course in North Carolina, I um, built the zip wire, which was, gosh, hundreds of yards of steel cable going through the trees um, at the side of the Outward Bound School there. And um, it stood as quite a, a model ropes course until Mike came and completely obliterated uh, <laughs> the, the, um, the course and built the most amazing, well-known, perhaps the most striking ropes course in the world uh, immediately after it. But during the time that we put the steel cable up, um, we uh, had to deal with the trees, which uh, we managed to get it high enough so that there was only about three trees left. Um, that were um, dang, you know, the, the, tr the cable was dangling into, and the governor or lieutenant governor were going to come up to open the Upper Bound School tomorrow. So there was this question about what to do about cleaning the trees. So I went up with my um, 
Nepali, you know, curved knife, sharpened specially. And I climbed the trees and I got up the first one and topped it. And then I went up the second one and I pretty much cut my arm. I, I cut deeply into my arm. Uh, blood went everywhere. I um, went to the hospital, was taken to the hospital, and they sewed it all up and everything. And um, a few days later, I found that I couldn't, it was all, you know, um, I was unable to do much with my left hand. I couldn't button things and, and I felt it was just completely weak. And so I went to the nurse, Marie Shirey, bless her, and she said, you've got to see the doctor immediately. Got the doctor and uh, we get, got in the car, went down to Chapel Hill and found Dr. Peacock, the hand surgeon, who, I mean, I went down with Doc Borden, um, then on the board of the Upper Bound School. He uh, knew Dr. Peacock, they, they knew each other, they were friends. And he said, I've got this mountain guy here who's uh, busted his hand and he needs you to have a look at it. So Peacock, I was literally out of the mountains. I was filthy. We drunk a, quite a lot of beer on the way down. So I was stinking like a, like a, a vagabond, looking like a vagabond. And um, he picked up my hand, looked at it, looked at the cut, said it's healing well, it's pretty good, looks fine. And he got up to leave. And uh, Doc Borden stopped him, and I stood up too. And Doc said, this guy's a violinist. He's got a left hand that he really needs. And uh, it's not right, something's gone. And I told him, I said, I, I, can't, I can't use this hand. There's something really wrong. So I remember Peacock turning around and looking at me and saying, uh, you're a fiddler, you're a violinist. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> he said, oh, all right. And he sat down and he put two fingers on my wrist and he said, lift your wrist, lift your wrist. And then he put two fingers on my other wrist and he said, lift your wrist. I did that. He went back over there, lift your wrist. So he went back, traced each finger, all of the the wires and the tendons and all this stuff and he went back there and then he checked it and he said well he said you've got three extensors to your wrist he said you've cut through two of them he said did you ever notice anything when you cut did you ever notice anything going back up your arm and I did I remembered it I saw them going when I went like that after I had uh, uh, cut it so he said I'm not sure there's anything I can do he said but we're gonna get you in now I was on, this, on the table within hours, literally. And I got use of this hand back completely, 100%, purely and absolutely due to Dr. Peacock. And I'd like to finish by saying that thank you, Mike, for offering this opportunity to bleat out all these memories. What you're doing is carrying the spirit of, the spirit of adventure forward with what you do to young people, which is so important in today's world. And uh, I'm trying to do the same with my, my students at the present time too. And uh, I'd like to finally ask whether you think this left hand is okay. What advice do you have for the modern day climbers from the oh, experience no. you, <laughs> you had? Uh, this, <laughs> this is going to sound, this almost sounds hokey, it's so, um, it's so obvious. Uh, you're, you're climbing today, one of these days you're not going to be. Take it in and enjoy it and have a good time. It's not going to last forever, believe me. <laughs>